Hey everybody, on today's episode, we're gonna be taking a look at this laptop from 1990. Do you recognize this logo over here? Well, it doesn't quite look the same as the one you might see today on some of this equipment. So, will this thing actually run and how does it compare with other laptops from the late 90s? We're gonna find out right now on the Retro Hack Shack. All right, well, welcome to another edition of E-Waste Wednesday. This is for those of you who are new, maybe some new subscribers, uh, which there are many. Thank you so much for uh, subscribing to the channel. Uh, but if you're new, that means that this is the day where I typically go hunt around at some e-waste places, and I typically will find something to bring back and talk about on the channel. And so I turn those into videos because some of the stuff like this laptop here today is super, super interesting. This laptop is the Dell 320 LT, which came out in 1990, and uh, it is a uh, very bulky laptop. This thing is super, super heavy. I'm also testing a new setup with my overhead camera, which is up here, and so I may be using that from time to time, but I can already tell that it is not lined up correctly. Uh, so I'll be working on that over time, but at least it does give me an overhead view of what the laptop looks like. So before we take a look at the laptop itself, I thought I'd take a look at a few things from the interwebs so we can get a better idea of what the features are of this laptop and kind of a little bit of the history of it here. You know, Dell came into existence actually as a company known as PC Limited in 1984. And I have a PCs Limited ISA card that I pulled out of a 5150 in the Hack Shack. And I had to look up and see PCs Limited, what's that? And it turns out uh, that it's actually, they changed their name to Dell. And you can see the logos here uh, on the top left here. And you can see that logo that's on this laptop, that original logo. They say here it was in use from 1987 to 1989, but we know this laptop is from 1990. So I guess it made it onto the, at least the plastics for some of their uh, computers into the 90s. And then you can see the more familiar logos that um, have come about since that time. Now, moving on to a Byte magazine from October of 1990, uh, this was when Dell was really making a hard push to sell their systems and compete with IBM. And you can see here that they are advertising not only a free catalog, but all sorts of things. They even had a custom insert uh, that was inserted into the magazine where you could just send off for their catalog. So they tried to make it really easy, but just look at how long this ad is. They've got not just the insert, but this first page here, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen pages. This must have cost them a fortune. Thirteen color pages in Byte Magazine in October of 1990 to advertise their systems. And we can see down here two systems, uh, two laptops that they had available. The laptop um, that I have here today, which was the 320LT and the 316LT. So actually the year before Dell had released this 316 LT and this is the first laptop they ever released. However, these laptops are so similar, I feel pretty comfortable calling the 320 LT the first generation or in the first generation of laptops that came from Dell. If you look at the specs of the two machines, this uh, earlier laptop is running a 386 at 16 megahertz while the 320LT, the 20 is the key part of that model number, is running the 386SX at 20 megahertz. Oh, and there's also one meg more of RAM included in this price here that they put on the page, and the hard drive is a little bit bigger. So 40 megabyte hard drive, two megs of RAM versus 20 megabyte hard drive, one meg of RAM. And you can see the price difference, almost $4,000 for the 320LT and $3,000 after about a year of being in the market for the 316 LT. And the way that they talked about this 320 LT, they called it the lap of luxury. So this was really high end, or at least they considered it high end for the day. And they compare this with a compact 
SLT 386, what they call the lap of lunacy. So they were going hard, not just after IBM, but also after Compaq at this point in time. I also wanted to take a look at a review for this laptop, and so I found this PC Magazine from March 12th, 1991, and you can see they reviewed both the 316LT and the 320LT in this in this kind of roundup where they looked at several laptops. And uh, one of the things that they said, which we'll see in a minute, is that uh, even though this laptop has a lot of features, it also weighs 15 pounds. So they basically say it barely survives the cut for inclusion in this overview uh, because I think, like I said uh, in a little bit, it actually almost qualifies as a portable rather than a laptop. Now, it's interesting to see that this laptop did make the editor's choice um, and uh, they talk about the different options it has, but basically, um, you know, they like the batteries, they like the display. So one thing that they talk about here is the batteries themselves and the fact that this laptop has uh, an extra internal battery so that you can actually change the battery out without shutting the laptop down. You can just eject the battery, it will run on that other battery temporarily that's inside the laptop and you can stick a new battery pack in and keep running. So that's actually pretty cool. And they also talk about its power saving features like going into standby mode mode, reducing the uh, clock speed of the processor down to 8 megahertz, as well as turning off the display. So they really, really like those um, power saving features. And I've got to say, with this thing being so big, I bet it does draw a considerable amount of power. The other thing they mentioned is that it has a connector for an external disk drive, as well as an expansion connector. So I don't know if that's just feeding out the ISA bus out of a port in the back or what, um, but they overall seem to really like this particular laptop. Like I said, it got an Editor's Choice Award. Now this laptop is in great shape overall, very clean, no scratches on it. The only thing that I really see cosmetically that's wrong with it is it has this rubber um, coating here on some of the areas of the laptop, like in the front here, which is all sticky. So I'll see, I'll have to see if I can clean that up, perhaps with some alcohol or by replacing this section of the laptop. So starting on the back here, the first thing I noticed is this handle or stand. This comes down, I guess it could be used to carry the laptop around if you wanted to use it as a handle. And it could also be used to prop up the laptop like that, uh, giving you a little bit of ergonomic, um, maybe some strain relief for your fingers as you were typing on the keyboard. And it also allows us to take a quick peek in the back here and see what all the ports are. So right away, I can see that there are parallel COM ports. There is a uh, VGA port here, as well as what looks to be a PS2 port, and there's two modem ports here. So I'm assuming this would be pass-through, so you could plug one end into your wall and perhaps the other end into your phone so that you could have both of those connected or perhaps pass that through to a fax machine, who knows? Um, in the back here is actually another modem port or modem with two ports. So I'm guessing that this actually has some sort of a bus a card slot here, perhaps an ISA slot that you can stick additional cards into, which could be really cool if you wanted to add, for example, a sound card or perhaps even a networking card so you could hook this up to your network. And then down at the bottom here, we can see the expansion port and the external uh, disk drive port that we saw from the review. Over here on this side, there is a built-in three and a half inch floppy drive, which is very nice, and that's about it for this side. Taking a look at this side, there is a power button, a reset button, and the power plug itself, as well as this little slot here where the battery goes. Let's see if I can actually, yeah, it does slide out. So there's the battery, pretty beefy uh, battery. And I think it was fairly common. Whoops, I guess I have to lock that. There we go, lock that manually. And for those that are interested, here is the uh, details on the bottom. Model number here, SYS320LT, uh, 16 volt uh, power supply it looks like here, 2.3 amps, and looks like this was sold at CompUSA in Torrance, California, uh, because that's what the sticker here says, a little sign off by the uh, technician. Maybe they, uh, this is warranty seal, I mean, maybe they worked on this, maybe they repaired something in it, who knows, uh, but it's kind of neat to see that uh, 
a little bit of history there since CompUSA is no longer in existence. And I almost missed that other little sticker down there that says Northrop. So this laptop must have been used in Northrop Grumman at some point. That must be a asset tag. Okay, let's just open this thing up and see what it looks on the inside. I'm curious to see what the keyboard looks like. The way that you open this is uh, these uh, little latches here, which are rubberized, as I mentioned before, but you press down those two latches and open it up. And uh, yeah, you get this nice, uh, what I'm guessing is a backlit display here with uh, contrast and brightness options. We'll see a lot of times these uh, displays are either very dim or they need capacitors replaced. So we'll have to see if this thing even fires up, whether how bright this LCD is um, or whether it'll even brighten up. Sometimes they brighten up over time if you let them run for a while. So we'll see how that goes. And then here's the keyboard. Um, very nice feeling keyboard. It has some really cool blue accents on it. Um, I guess to match the coloring of the Dell logo up here, but like the function keys, all the special keys are all have this really cool, like aqua blue, almost they look like they glow in the dark. I know they don't, but certainly looks like that. But yeah, the keyboard is, uh, you know, really full size keys and feels really good to use. Uh, we got a power light. We've got a standby button. So perhaps you could put this in standby mode by pressing that. And then we've got some uh, LED indicators here for low battery and drive A or drive zero. So I'm not sure if that is, uh, there's a hard drive in here. Maybe A is the floppy, zero is the hard drive. That's what I would assume. One more thing that you can see here is the ruggedized feel of this as well. Um, they've got this uh, rubber bumpers here on both sides of the machine. It's definitely not a ruggedized laptop like would come later in the later 90s where they had really ruggedized tough book kind of things um, that were all rubber everywhere and you could drop them from three feet and they wouldn't break. But interesting just to see that they added this detail here. One other really cool feature of this laptop is it has a removable display. So by pressing this uh, little button here under the display, you can actually lift up on the monitor and it will actually come off. It has this little card slot connector that slots down into there so that you can remove the display completely. And then when you're done, you simply find the uh, guiding notches there and slide it back in. You do have to press the button back in to get it to seat fully into the connector there. But once you do that, you're good to go. I guess the thing they wanted to do here was provide a way to access the keyboard so you could stick this underneath a monitor stand and then use the monitor on top with the laptop keyboard below. Okay, so I just wanted to compare this Dell laptop with a couple others that are in my collection. Um, this one is a Toshiba T5100, and this actually came out much earlier, but it is a similar form factor. But if I lift this up, you'll see, first of all, crack screen. Uh, this is something I want to do something about in a repair video later. Um, but it also has a very similar keyboard, full-size keyboard. I was struck by the fact that they do look quite similar, even though this one uh, came out three years earlier. The other laptop that I thought it would be interesting to compare with is this Packard Bell laptop. I believe uh, I did a video on this. I will link it up above if you want to see the teardown and me getting this thing working with some interesting uh, interesting workarounds to get the power into this device since I couldn't find the power adapter for it. But um, yeah, you can see how much smaller this laptop is just a year later, but it's got very similar features. VGA out, it's got a, a three and a half inch floppy drive, it's got all the similar ports in the back. And then when we open this up, Again, full-size keyboard, keys are slightly smaller, but still very, very functional. But you can see that things are starting to miniaturize when we get to 1991. There's even a standby button, same as this laptop has over here. Oh, and of course, this is much, much lighter. I did take the battery out of this, but now we're talking about, you know, maybe an eight pound laptop with the battery in there, or maybe even less, maybe five or six pounds, because this is, this is pretty light. Okay, well now I think it's time to test this thing out and see if it's working. This laptop comes with a unique power plug. It's a three pin uh, DIN or three pin power DIN uh, connector. And if you can see here, um, it's got a little, uh, like a little pin there and then two bigger pins 
and they're kind of offset on the power plug. Exactly the same type of plug used in my video on the uh, Packard Bell laptop, although the voltages are different. So the voltages on that one were two separate voltages. I can't remember exactly, like 7.5 and 5 or something weird like that. This one just has one voltage, which is 16, but I'm guessing that you really need to be careful of this. Not only are these hard to find, but you need to be careful they're not all the same voltage, uh, expecting the same voltage input either. So you need to be very careful. Now, if you have one of these Dell laptops that takes a 16 volt power supply, 16 volt DC power supply, uh, I was able to find something that would substitute for that since I don't have the original. And it's this power supply for the Harman Kardon uh, Soundstick 3, 1, 2, I don't know which one it's for exactly. Um, but these Harman Kardon Soundsticks take a 16 volt supply with that same power connector. Now you do need to make sure that you have sufficient amperage, so that's important here. A lot of these I was seeing were like 1 amp, 1.5 amp, and we saw from the back of the laptop that this uh, power draw could go up as high as 2.3 amps. So I got this one, and it's supposed to be a 2 amp uh, supply, and uh, sure enough, when I got it, it does indeed match that amperage rating. Okay, power supply is connected. Here comes the power switch. Looking good. Power light. Drive zero has a light. I don't know what that means, but the screen came on. Not sure you can see anything on it, but I can see very dimly some stuff. A strike F1 key, something or other, invalid configuration. I'm starting to be able to read the display just a little bit. Let me turn off the lights and zoom, zoom in here so we can see what this is actually saying. Hopefully you can see it on camera. All right, so hopefully you can see this. I am, whoops, did it just turn off? Ah, standby, standby button works. I guess the screen itself is on standby mode, so the screen goes out perhaps when uh, there's been no uh, interaction for a while. But it's starting to get brighter and brighter. Uh, it says Phoenix BIOS um, 85 to 88. I'm starting to be able to read this a lot better. Like I said, with these before, what I've had is if I leave them on for a while, then they start to brighten up and, and get useful again. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, the F1 key to continue, and hopefully we'll get to a point where this thing doesn't auto shut off because I need the screen to stay on for it to brighten up. Oh, and we can play with the controls as well, the brightness controls and see if they do anything. Uh, ooh, yep, that turned off, standby. Okay, so here's the brightness controls. Oh, look at that. Okay. Yeah, that's looking better. Now, I don't think it's supposed to be, this is like really like over bright. I don't think it's supposed to be that bright, but at least now we can read what it says and maybe step through some of the setup here. Now that I can read this, I can see it has 640K of base memory and 4K, 4 uh, meg of extended memory. That's nice. Okay, so I pulled out a monitor. This one just happens to be appropriately a Dell monitor with the logo that they've been using for forever, not the old Dell monitor. Uh, so yeah, let's power it on. I plugged it in. Let's power it on and see if there's any signal going out the VGA port in the back there. We've got no video over there. Well, this time I'm going to go ahead and do F2 to run the setup utility. Ooh, not looking good. Yeah, so now we're back to where we were before. When I hit reset, there's no screen at all. Well, at this point, I am getting nothing. The display is intermittent uh, on the laptop, and I can't get it to boot. And if I go into the CMOS, I just get that wonky screen. So... I think we need to take this apart and see what's going on. Perhaps there's some leaky caps, or perhaps just a dead battery is somehow messing up uh, the, the BIOS and stuff. So let's take it apart and see what we can see on the inside. Now, taking apart this laptop was pretty easy. It was just a matter of removing nine screws on the back. Ooh, here we go. So that was pretty easy to get into. Um, looks like the floppy drive is here and they've got a really nice little diagram here 
that shows where everything goes. So it looks like to remove the top cover, I just need to disconnect these LCD cables here and then figure out a way to disconnect the battery, uh, which looks like it goes here. Oh yeah, uh, it goes into the motherboard down here and I do see a battery also connected to this thing. So maybe if we're lucky, that's all that's wrong with this. It's just, I need to replace that battery. Let me get these cables disconnected. Okay, well, here's the processor right here, 386. SX20 processor, and here I'm assuming is the place for the coprocessor. At least that's what that looks like. Uh, what else is on the board? Here's the memory, and this is great because these are standard 30 pin uh, memory modules, and there's room for four more. So if I want to max this out, I could actually just simply add standard memory modules. The other thing I see in here is there's not one but two batteries. Um, I need to check out and see what this board is here, but they're both plugged into this board. Maybe it's some sort of a um, power, analog power board or something. But yeah, there's two batteries in here. Um, and I'm for sure both of these are probably dead. So maybe I can just unplug these and get things to work, but maybe they are required in order to get things to work smoothly. So that, there's actually three batteries in total in this machine, very similar to the uh, Packard Bell, which also had this same kind of battery configuration. Now here's the add-on modem card. We can actually take this out as well, um, since it's not necessarily required. Whoops, I need a different screwdriver. Since it's not required for this thing to work, but what I am noticing is that it will need to be, if you want to put any other card in here, it'll have to be a specific size card because of the way that the laptop goes together. It really can't be any longer than this card is here. But let's just go ahead and try to take it out and see what's on here. Oh, it comes out easily enough. So there we go. That's a look at the modem card, the add-on modem card. It's got a, looks like a speaker for the modem tones here. And then it's got this daughter board, which, can I take that off? There we go. And I guess to make the card smaller, to make sure it would fit, they added this little daughter card here and it's got the uh, the BIOS on here. So here it is, US Robotics 1990, it says on the BIOS. So yeah, they, this was probably originally a longer card and to make it fit in this particular laptop, they had to combine things, combine multiple boards on top of each other and sandwich them together uh, to make it fit. So that's pretty cool. And with that out of the way, there's also a, a couple of BIOS chips in here. Uh, probably an upper and a lower BIOS or, you know, the old days you had to have two BIOS chips at least for the BIOS to work. So there's a couple of BIOSes and I want to say these are just EEPROMs. So perhaps I could read these um, and reprogram them even if I really wanted to, but that's pretty cool. And there's a lot of Dell uh, custom chips in here too. This is a custom IC from Dell. There's a couple others that are marked Dell here, very fancy marked Dell ICs. So yeah, Dell was putting their own chips into these computers um, at this point. The other interesting thing on this sticker is it says down here, System 316 LT, was, which was the very first Dell laptop, and then there's a 320 LT. So this probably worked for both the 316 and the 320. In order to get to the hard drive, I do need to take out the floppy drive, and I do want to inspect the hard drive. It sounds like it's spinning, but um, it's also spinning over and over again. So I do want to take that out and just do a physical inspection, see if see if there's anything interesting about it or anything that's obviously failed on it. When I took apart the Packard Bell laptop, the hard drive that was in there uh, was a Connor two and a half inch drive, and it has a rubber, um, uh, kind of a rubber membrane that sealed the drive in the middle. It was kind of like a sandwich with the rubber membrane in the middle, and that had completely disintegrated and was ooey and gooey. So that drive had, had bit the, kicked the bucket or whatever. So hopefully that is not the case here. Okay, so I have no idea if this is a problem or not, but <clears throat> I took off this power supply board and was testing it and inspecting it. Um, and right down here um, at the bottom of these caps, I noticed was a little sticky. Um, and when I pulled off the hot snot that these, um, that was around these, let's see if I can get this to focus this close. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but this is the hot snot that was uh, around that those two brown caps down there. 
And when I put my finger on it, you can see that it is sticky. It's got some electrolytic uh, coming through. Not much, but just a little bit of leakage. Don't know if this is the problem, but I'm going to see if I can replace these two caps and at least give that a try because that would be an easy fix. Here's what it looked like. There's lots of liquid on the bottom, and when I was heating this up, with the uh, desoldering gun to take this out, it smelled really, really bad. So this is definitely a leaky cap. And this tested good with the ESR meter when it was in circuit. I'm going to test it again in a minute. So this one is registering good cap with low ESR. This one is registering good cap with low ESR. So it just goes to show you, you know, whether this cap is good, whether this fixes the problem, I don't know, but um, it was a leak, definitely a leaky cap. Uh, one of these was, and yet they're still testing good. So if this does fix the problem, you know, it just goes to show you that sometimes caps can measure good, but still be bad, but we don't know that yet. So let me change these out. All right, well, that didn't fix it, but uh, there is another uh, brown cap uh, similar to these over here that I replaced that were leaking. And uh, when I look really closely, maybe I can, you know, it's kind of hard to see, but this is leaking as well. So uh, yucky brown electrolyte or yucky electrolyte coming out of this cap right here. So yep, this one's going to have to go as well. And I'll be on the hunt for any other of those brown ones. There's a few more here. Those I can see very clearly. They do not appear to be leaking. So I'll just kind of keep going on these caps. Hopefully I'll find one that fixes the problem. All right, well, I finally got desperate and uh, yeah, I went ahead and took the board off of the bottom plate of the laptop and right away I noticed something very wrong about this board. Yeah, so integrated circuits like this are not supposed to foam around <laughs> the circuits. And if I touch this, ooh, yeah. It's ooey and gooey. So somehow something has leaked here. The weird thing is there's nothing on the other side of the board. So my only thought is that somehow that one capacitor, that big capacitor that was over here, somehow leaked through this mounting bracket because you can see that the, uh, well, maybe you can see that the pads here around this uh, this mounting bracket are corroded. And then it went into these two um, circuits here, these two chips. So yeah, I'm going to have to clean these up and then inspect for damage. Unfortunately, there's also a bunch of traces that run underneath these. So I've got to have some really good luck here to hope that uh, this will work and that all of these pads and things aren't eaten away. And given this problem, as you can see how bad it is, I'm surprised that this thing even booted at all, even though it was intermittent at best. Okay, well, I just got done cleaning up these ICs, and luckily I don't see any damage to traces or um, or to pads. And uh, what's nice is you, if you have a camera, I've talked about this before, if you have a decent camera with a decent uh, like wide-angle lens on it or something, you can actually get really in, you don't even need a a scope, a, a microscope to see this, you can actually get really close to what you're looking at and take a look at the pad. Sorry, it's a little shaky. Um, but this is this is kind of what I do. Um, it, you can see all the traces there. You can see the pads. You know, my vision's not so good anymore, but definitely it looks like things are just fine. But just because there wasn't any uh, physical damage here doesn't mean it wasn't affecting things. When I took off that liquid, it wasn't just kind of an orange... Um, electrolytic mess. It was also had some dark stuff in it, some black stuff. It could have been uh, conductive. I didn't test that, but that's certainly a possibility. So I'm hoping if I just flip this board back around and do a test, maybe that will solve uh, the problem. And it's the next day, by the way. And uh, yep, I had another finger operated on or another part of my hand operated on. And uh, so unfortunately, it's going to slow me down here a little bit. So it's a bummer, but it's uh, something I've got to live with until all my fingers are fixed, I guess, eventually. And look, even my doctor even signed my uh, uh, the finger she operated on. That was her way of signifying so she didn't forget which finger she was working on. She put her initials there, which is kind of funny. Uh, so yeah, I've got an autograph from my doctor of uh, her handiwork. Handiwork? Get it? Wah, 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 wah. 
All right, so I've pieced back the components here. Uh, hopefully this does it, who knows? I've got the keyboard connected just in case things start working. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. Okay, that's good. Got a display this time. Let's see if it actually holds. Should give me the option to go into the BIOS. Hopefully that whatever that gunk was on the back is what fixes this thing and allows me to get further than uh, just this. Oh, wait, wait, here we go, here we go. Hard disk failure, okay. Let's go ahead and hit F2 and see if it'll actually go into the BIOS now. Yes, this is a success. This is a success. Okay, let me, uh, let me pull the display up closer. We can take a closer look at what's going on. Okay, so it has lost all configuration and it probably will lose configuration until I um, adjust the, or put a new battery in to hold the BIOS settings. But let's just see if we can go walk through here and configure this and maybe actually get uh, past this into the hard drive and see if the hard drive is working. I'm really afraid it's not because the hard drive keeps spinning up and spinning down. But we can worry about that later. Let's see if we can get past the BIOS here and see if it'll even start to look at the hard drive. So I'm assuming this is a 1.44 meg drive, hopefully. Ah, here we go. Monitor toggle. This allows you to turn the, the external monitor on and off, right? Uh, disable, enables and disables the control alt F11 key. So I actually want that on. Well, it's not going to save it anyway, but now at least I know if that's on control alt F11 will toggle the external VGA port on and off. That's cool. Now this does say that there's a, a total of four meg of RAM installed, so that's good. And look at this folks, it is booting into DOS 6.22. What I had to do was I had to, actually had to remove the IDE connection from the hard drive and just leave the floppy drive there connected. And it does absolutely boot into DOS. So let's see, let's read the disk. Whoops. Some of these keys are a little sticky. There we go. Boom, yep, DOS 6.22 is there. So now I've got to figure out if I can at least get this program right here, which is a great program, whatide.com. If you look that up on Google, you'll find it. This can be really helpful for finding out what the IDE uh, disk parameters should be if you're using something like a, uh, well, a drive that you don't know what the parameters are, or if you're using like a um, IDE to XT adapter and you're using a compact flash card or an SD card, which was going to have some sort of uh, strange disk layout to DOS, you can use what IDE to find out what that layout should be and then plug those values into a BIOS, an older BIOS like this one that doesn't have like an automatic detection. So really good tip there, what IDE.com. So I'm here in the BIOS trying to figure out what type this is. I know from what IDE, what, what that's reporting. And I notice that when you hover over here, if I hit page down, it says you can find the correct drive type number. So here, if I just match up the data, head, cylinders, and sectors, it's 762 cylinders or something like that. Let's see, seven. Okay, here's the closest one here. We had 762, eight heads, and 39 sectors. This is 761. So it would be 47 if this drive is even working. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this for 47 and reboot. Unfortunately, there's no custom type I can put in. If this drive doesn't work, that's going to make it difficult for putting in some sort of hard drive because it'll have to be a really old one that's still working in order to work in this machine. But let's see if this will work. Hard disk failure. Okay. So let's do F2 again. Is it still set for type 47? It is, and it's not working. So now I'm going to have to find a different solution if I want to put a hard drive in here. Now, one thing that happened when I was testing because my hand kept getting in the way and because I wasn't properly protecting this power supply board over here is I powered it on one time with the power supply a little bit loose 
and I heard a little zzz and nothing came on. And so it looked like I had shorted something out, but I got everything worked out and it looks like whatever circuit in here is doing the power protection reset itself and the system is booting up again. Now I looked through all of my hard drives to try to find one that would work with this machine. The difficulty here is that it only takes certain types of hard drives that were available when this came out back in 1990. And there's no option for a uh, a user configurable uh, setting for the hard drive so that you can set the cylinders and the heads and the sectors, etc. So that is going to make it pretty difficult to connect uh, a hard drive to this to get it up and running past this point. Like I said, I've got no hard drives from that era. I've got some old ones, but none of them that old. And the options I have uh, for hard drive, connecting hard drives, I just don't have the right configuration for this machine. So I've ordered some stuff on eBay and I'm going to go ahead and do some other videos while I'm waiting for that to come in. And then I'll come back to this in part two and we'll see if we can get DOS loaded, some games loaded up here, maybe even Windows 3.1, although you know that would have been uh, something that somebody probably would have done to this machine at some point. So that will be coming up in part two. Make sure you hit the bell and that will notify you when that episode comes out. If you're interested in seeing how this Dell 320LT actually performs. So until then, thanks everybody for liking and subscribing to, to my channel. Got a big bump in subscribers again. Uh, so it's, it feels like people are discovering my channel and I'm just flattered that uh, all the comments that people are leaving and the fact that they're, you're subscribing, I think it's just uh, kind of blows my mind actually. So thank you for that. Thank you, especially to my patrons as well. If you want to become a patron and see your name in the credits, you can go to patreon.com, hit my channel up and become a patron subscriber or member or whatever they call them. And uh, you'll get your name in the credits. You'll get some behind the scenes commentary and uh, some special things as well. So anyway, Thanks everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, see you later. In a world where viewers want to support the channel, they will sign up on Patreon and receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary and, of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy. And I thank you for your support of the Retro Hack Shack. End of line.